Hi, everyone. I am so excited because I am speaking with authors Tess Gerritsen and Gary Braver about their brand new book coming out July 1st. And Gary has a copy of it. It's called Choose Me, Love the Cover. Love the cover. Perfect. Absolutely. I love seeing it as opposed to seeing it on my phone. I love seeing it like that. And this book is incredible. I could not put it down. I couldn't stop reading it. I had just come off another book. You know, one of those books that you just hated to end. And then I picked up your book and I, I have a hard time restarting. No, I did not. I was like, I was <laughs> right from page one. I was hooked. So Tess, tell me how you two got to working together on this book, because both of you have so many books apart. How did you decide to do this one together? It happened over cocktails. <laughs> we, we were at a Christmas party in Boston at a bookstore and uh, I've been paying a lot of attention to the Me Too movement um, and it was in the news and all these guys were getting into trouble um, and I thought well wouldn't it be interesting to do a story about a Me Too situation but to tell it from the point of view of both the man and the woman who were involved in this illicit affair. Uh, but I wanted to do it in a way that we would have a man write the male point of view not just me doing everything. Um, and so I mentioned it to Gary and, and we got, we both realized it would be a lot of fun to do it together. And, and that's how it happened. Um, he would write a chapter, he'd send it to me. I would write the next chapter. I'd send it back to him. It was a sort of the sequential writing. I love when two people write together. It's like one of my favorite things is to like, especially to be able to talk to you guys. You think that it, but in this day and age, it isn't as hard as it used to be. It's like, some people won't say what they've written. Now you've said he wrote the man's point of view and this had a lot of point of views. So did you write the other, did he just focus on the men and then you focused on the women? Yes, that was the, that was the agreement at the beginning is that I would be the female points, points of view. And there are two women in this story. There is the, the, the young woman who was involved in the affair. And then there's the, the detective uh, who comes in to solve it afterwards. And Gary was in charge of, of writing pro the most pivotal point of view, which is right. the man's, because it's really, the story is the man's point of view and what happens when you make a mistake and how does it blow up your life, right? right. <laughs> so, Thankfully, this is not autobiographical. <laughs> that's, right. that's right. So Gary, did you, who, how did you decide how you, you know, what the story was gonna be about? Like how you were gonna go about the structure of the story? Sure. Um, we decided that it would be a collegiate setting. And he'd be a college, the male would be a college professor and he would be taking up with the student. But this is, even though this is a mystery or slash thriller, it is not just plot driven. This is character driven. That is what happens are internal changes as opposed to external influences. And that is what drives the narrative. So I knew that he would be, I wanted him to be nuanced I want him not to be a, an irresponsible womanizer uh, going after all his pretty you know, students. Um, and I wanted to, and Tess agreed, we wanted to make this layered characterization and a study of people who get involved in something uh, and that is later leads to being regretful of that it happened. Um, and it is a new wine in an old bottle. It goes right back to the season famous letters of Abelard and Heloise, the older mentor um, at the Sorbonne taking up with a, a young woman who was half his age and not even, she probably was 14 or 15 and he was 40-ish. Uh, it's, it's, you know, a forbidden affair. Um, he's older, he's not married, but he's a man of the cloth and she's a child practically. Uh, they fall in love and they write these extraordinary love letters over, over the rest of their lives. Um, in the 12th century, and that became the kind of bottle that we're going to put this new stuff in. And it, it's a familiar trope, adultery, a familiar trope of a professor, teacher getting involved with a student. But we wanted to make this a character-driven novel, as well as having a very strong plot and suspense element. Well, and it definitely was. And, and Tess, when you were writing Tar uh, Taryn, um, the, the title, Choose Me, it was like, she just wanted to be chosen, basically, at all. Like, I looked at her, I was like, it felt so bad for her because it was almost like she, in every aspect of her life, she wanted to be chosen. 
So how did you come up with making her so vulnerable in that, you know, in like choose me? And it's like, it wasn't just about Jack. It was about in every area of her life, she needed to be chosen. Yeah. Well, Taryn is not designed to be an easy to like person. She's, she's a complex girl. And I will use the word girl because at my age, everybody under 30 is a girl. <laughs> um, I, not only, she's a little bit of a, a villain and a heroine because even though she does terrible things, even though she um, really causes this man to violate his, his marital vows, she does it because she has, she has needs. She's a desperate young woman. And I think even if you don't like her, you could understand the desperation that can make uh, anybody do things that are out of character. So when I was writing her, I was thinking more about, about neediness, um, about what it's like to be betrayed again and again in your, in your life and how every relationship after that is going to feel like a betrayal. You're always going to be, you know, thinking that this man is going to leave me, and that, um, and that's what drives Taryn is she does not want Jack to leave her. Right. She wants him to choose her right. and not his wife. Yes, yeah, and I just felt bad for her. I mean, right, like she, her whole life, like you know, she had issues her entire life, and and she just even even though she was smart, like you wrote, I mean, she's a smart girl, right? I mean, yeah. and, but then well. <laughs> We, we all know really intelligent women who've made bad choices. <laughs> it's, right. Just because you're intelligent doesn't mean um, you, you know how to live your life. Right, exactly. And, and me, me too pointed out the intelligent men who make horrible choices too. <laughs> correct. correct, because he had that little bit of a crack, okay, in his yes. marriage, right? I mean, yes, yes, yes. And, yes. And it's scary because you're like, it only takes that crack. But um, right, right. did you have a hard time making him, you know, making us love him? Because you wanted us not to hate him, right? Right. I don't think people love him. I think people maybe sympathize with him and, and make him, I mean, what did do it was his sense of regret, his sense of guilt. Um, there is that slight justification, the crack you're talking about, the, the, the lack of intimacy back home because his wife is on a treadmill kind of career. Um, but he, um, after it happens, and they're flawed characters, and after it happened, he is, he is just consumed with guilt. It, he is tortured by it. Um, he has violated his marital vows. He has violated his position as a professor at a university. He's, once again, he kind of used and abandoned a female, which is the theme of all this material he's teaching in his seminar. Um, and th that is, you know, that is the story of his life, but, but we're just trying to make him contrite enough so readers say, okay, I get it. I understand it. You're not as bad as you could be. You know, you're not a Lothario, you know. So. Well, I thought that, that, like you said about character driven, like, I don't look at this book as like, you're just trying to figure out who did it. I look right. at it like, I wanted to see what was going to happen to these characters, you know, what happened to every character that you guys hit on. But Tess with Frankie, I loved Frankie because, well, she was smart, right? She wasn't buying into what, the, what they were trying to portray as a suicide. She was not buying it, but you're very good. I mean, all your other books have shown like you like that female detective kind <laughs> of writing, right? <laughs> well, Frankie has the benefit of the wisdom of age. Um, she's an older detective. She's a, she's got teenage daughters of her own, um, and I, you you actually hit the nail on the head. This book is not necessarily a whodunit, even though that's that's part of it. It's not a whodunit. It's more we got to this point where there's a murder. Let's let's back up and see how these these characters got to this terrible point. Um, I characterize it as the train wreck. We see the train has already been wrecked. Now we want to back up and see. How did, how did we get to this point? Um, but what I loved about Frankie was that I identify with her. I'm a mom. You know, I, I know what it's like to, to raise teenagers and how you always have to have eyes in the back of your head. And that, to me, is a real advantage when you're a cop. Yeah, absolutely. And that, and you brought up the point, the before, after. So we have, not only do we have these points of view, right? But then we have the before and the after. And I loved how you guys did that. I, because I look forward to each one. When I got to the before, I'm like, yes, I want to know. <laughs> I want to know. Great. 
that led to a lot of complications, just putting those pieces together, because you don't want to reveal too much in the after, because you still want to make the before a mystery. So there was a lot of fine tuning about which details to reveal in which time frame. Yeah, I, I can only imagine. But the burning question I have is this, did this spark something? Are you going to continue to do these? Well, we have both got solo de solo projects that we're working on. And I, I think that what ended up happening was because it was a complicated, the structure was so complicated, it probably took twice as long to write this book as it would <laughs> each of us to write our own wow. right right yeah, and here I'm except, except i don't think i could have done it without her because because tess knew the medical stuff she knows the forensic stuff i mean she's done recently in aisles for years um and i would have had to have gone and done research and talked to cops and you know <laughs> chasing all over town trying to you know get some answers to certain things so that was that came to her her naturally that was great she didn't know the professorial world, the academic world as well. So that's what I filled in. You know. oh, and, 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 a, and a guilty male, <laughs> a psyche. <laughs> <laughs> I, but that's what I was thinking. I'm like, well, maybe because of technology and Google Docs or whatever you use, that it would be quicker. Like you could throw together, you know, what would take a year into six months instead of, you know, the opposite. You would think. <laughs> <laughs> It always work that way. <laughs> when two heads are working together, yeah, you can get the story, the basic story down faster, but it is how do you weave these two voices together or these three voices together? And how do you make the before and after time frame work? And that ended up being less of a creative issue and more of a of an editorial issue, I think, that made it a longer project. Well, I hope you do another one. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I vote for another one. I think all of the readers that are going to be reading this book, what I was so excited to see is that this was picked as an Amazon first read, which yes, yes. I mean, that's, you know, right there, you get all your early readers, you get all your early reviewers. So, you know, I, I love that. I get so excited for you guys when that happens for your books, because it's a great big boost, you know, in the beginning. But I right. think after all the other writers, you know, all the other readers after us, come into it, I think that everybody is going to want you guys to, to do another one. And, and I'm not saying sequel or anything, but like a whole new, you know, a whole new story because it was really a fun, fun read. I love when I can get that immersed into a book that I, I have them on my phone. That's why I do this because I have it on my phone. I'm in the grocery store. I'm, <laughs> I'm doing laundry. And, and the chapters were so short that you can do that. And I love when in these kind of, especially in th any kind of psychological thriller or any of these books, when they have that short chapter that you're like, one more, just one more, okay, right, one right. more. Right. <laughs> so I, it was so much fun talking to you guys. Uh, Gary, hold Thank up you. the cover for everybody one more time so they get to see this. This book comes out next <laughs> Tuesday. There we go, right? It's next Tuesday, July, it's July 1st, next Tuesday. July 1st. <laughs> that, is that true? <laughs> Yeah, perfect. Absolutely perfect book. Hey. So much, guys. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Michelle. And if you write another one, I want to know. I want to be there. <laughs> <laughs> Have a great day. Thank you. You too. Thank Have you. Bye-bye.